One of the most common myths about experts and world-class performers is that natural talent plays a significant role in their success. The idea is that some people are born with innate abilities that make it easier for them to do great things. In other words, they are gifted with an unfair advantage that we may lack. However, Peak by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole details the real secret behind their success and how anyone can apply the same basic approach to master remarkable skills and abilities. So let's explore my three favorite insights from the book, beginning with insight number one, the extreme adaptability of the human brain. The truth is that talented people do indeed have a powerful gift, but it's not the unfair advantage that we typically believe it to be. And instead, it's something that we all have. And that gift is a brain that is flexible and adaptable in its ability to learn new skills. It's capable of rewiring itself to unlock entirely new abilities through focused practice. Now, of course, there are situations where genetic differences do play a role. Physical traits such as size or height can be advantageous when it comes to certain sports like basketball. And likewise, when it comes to swimming, having a wider reach can give someone like Michael Phelps a distinct advantage. However, when it comes to skill itself, there is no such thing as a predefined ability. Those considered gifted have simply made better use of the brain and body's ability to adapt, and they have done so by practicing relevant skills in a more effective way. Now, factors such as IQ can play a role in certain pursuits such as playing chess, but this advantage has virtually no impact beyond the very early beginner stages because as we'll explore in insight number three, mental representations developed through focused practice play a much, much bigger role in determining long-term success. The point here is that we are all gifted with a brain that is flexible and capable of rewiring itself. Thus, remarkable skill and remarkable talent is available to anyone willing to use this gift to its full potential. Let's continue on to insight number two, three different ways to engage in practice. Our ability to develop new skills requires that we invest time and effort into practice. However, not all forms of practice are equally effective for developing skill. So let's explore the three distinct approaches to practice that are covered in the book, including naive practice, purposeful practice, and deliberate practice. In doing so, we'll clarify the difference between world-class performers and mere hobbyists. Let's begin with naive practice. This approach is built on the misguided belief that time spent leads to mastery. When first setting out to learn a new skill, such as playing basketball, people generally focus on the fundamental skills required for the activity, in this case, shooting, passing, and dribbling. From there, they may aim to shore up a few weaknesses to reach an acceptable level of performance. That's the point at which they feel comfortable playing with their peers. However, it's at this point that most people hit a plateau. Instead of focusing on developing specific skills and abilities, they start to settle in to a comfortable routine. And as a result, they stop seeing progress despite continuing to practice and play the game in some cases for many years. In fact, depending on the exact pursuit, their skills may slightly decline over time. Next up is purposeful practice. This approach is focused on the achievement of specific, well-defined goals. It involves getting outside of one's comfort zone to learn a new skill in a focused way with clear goals, a plan for achieving those goals, and a way to monitor progress over time. Unlike naive practice, this requires clear expectations and total focus. The quality of the practice matters much more than the quantity of time spent. As explained in the book, the hallmark of purposeful practice is trying to do something you cannot already do. This involves practicing new skills repeatedly, focusing on exactly how you are doing them, where you are falling short, and how you can get better. 
Key to all of this is gathering reliable feedback so you know whether or not you're actually improving. Finally, we have deliberate practice. This approach follows the same core principles of purposeful practice. The key difference, however, is that it's informed and guided by the best performer's accomplishments and a deep understanding of what they did in order to be successful. As stated in the book, deliberate practice is purposeful practice that knows where it's going and how to get there. This approach allows experts to build on the progress of others. It's the reason why the latest generation of athletes, musicians, and gymnasts routinely outperforms those of the previous era. Their coaches help them incorporate best practices, avoid mistakes of the past, and thus push the boundaries of what was previously possible. It's worth noting there are relatively few fields in which deliberate practice can be applied in the strictest sense. Now these include, but are not limited to, playing chess, learning musical instruments, playing sports, and Olympic level competitions such as gymnastics. In each case, the underlying skills are well understood and effective training methods have been established that predictably lead to mastery. With that said, it is possible to apply the same basic strategy to less developed pursuits. As explained in the book, this often boils down to purposeful practice with a few extra steps. First, identify the expert performers. Then, figure out what they do that makes them so good. Then, come up with training techniques that allow you to do it, too. Let's continue on to insight number three, the power of effective mental representations. The key to becoming an expert is the development of mental representations that make it easier to spot patterns, make sense of complexity, and identify the correct course of action in a given situation. Even when a skill is primarily physical, a critical factor is the development of mental frameworks for engaging in the activity. A mental representation is a cognitive structure that corresponds to an object, an idea, a collection of information, or anything else, concrete or abstract. For example, consider how the word dog allows people to communicate more efficiently about a pet. Three simple letters, or even just the sound that they make, serves as a mental representation for a complex mammal with well-understood traits and behaviors. This kind of efficient encoding of information is all around us. Almost everything we do, including walking, speaking, reading, and writing is built on a complex web of mental representations. Without them, even the simple act of walking would require that we actively coordinate a complex series of muscle movements. Consider how a child learns to ride a bike. Early attempts are often frustrating because they don't yet know how to manage their balance while pedaling to keep the bike upright. However, once they develop the appropriate mental representations, riding becomes easy, even automatic. Now, the primary purpose of practice is to develop the appropriate mental representations for the skill or the ability that you're trying to master. Doing so initiates a virtuous cycle because as you develop better mental representations, you're more able to monitor and evaluate your performance. Thus, the more skilled you become, the better your mental representations are. And the better your mental representations are, the more effectively you're able to improve your skill. This is one reason why expert performers often appear to be fast learners. Their superior mental representations, developed through years and years of deliberate practice, allow them to acquire related skills, knowledge, and abilities faster. So while it is true that they can learn faster today, that wasn't always the case. The lesson here is that aspiring experts always seek to identify weaknesses in their skills or their abilities or their knowledge. Then they look for ways to address those weaknesses through purposeful practice or deliberate practice. That way they can develop the mental representations that they need to advance their skill or deepen their expertise. 
Anyway, those are three of my favorite insights from Peak by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. To learn more about how to become a world-class expert or performer, I recommend that you read the original book. 